Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hi and welcome to this NBTL course entitled Turn Century Fiction where we're looking at T.S. Eliot's poem The Wasteland. And in this lecture we'll hopefully conclude the poem as well as summarize some of the themes we've discussed already. So the final two sections of The Wasteland, um, the penultimate section called The Dead by Water which is a very small section, uh, is about the figure of drowning and obviously as you know Eliot uses what he described for James Joyce as a mythic method. Uh, so he brings in myths from uh, you know, historical, prehistorical times and he connects those conditions uh, to contemporary times in terms of how those are connectable and relatable and there are structural similarities. But the whole point of using certain mythic methods, uh, mythical figures uh, as it were, is to underline the decadence and exhaustion of civilization which is what the wasteland is all about. It's about the exhaustion of civilization, it's about the Westland as in the Western civilization coming to an end, uh, dying a natural death. So we talk about sexual sterility, we talk about spiritual sterility, we talk about uh, different kinds, different orders of decadence which the Wasteland keeps dramatizing. So just the section before that, uh, the fire sermon, we saw how at the, at the end of this particular section we have the references to St. Augustine as well as Buddha and how the Eastern and the Western philosophies they meet and how the movement is towards uh, spirituality from sexuality. So because both Buddha and Augustine, they had very earthly uh, sensual lives before they became spiritual. So the two figures are very carefully chosen by Eliot. Uh, and in this section, the penultimate section, Death by Water, which is again, which uh, repeats, uh, corroborates the entire sense of drowning which you find uh, over and over again in Eliot's early poetry, if you remember the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, you find that the final image is one of drowning, till human voices wake us and we drown. And we have this image of mermaid singing, so it's all about drowning and drowning, the sinking feeling of drowning is something which is connected to uh, existential annihilation, right? And that annihilation is something which the wasteland keeps dramatizing through contemporary as well as mythical figures. So this is uh, Dead by Water and this should be on the screen, the penultimate section of Wasteland. Flip is the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, for God's cry of gulls and a deep sea swell, and the profit and loss, a current under sea, picked his bones and whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, or you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Flibus, who was once handsome and tall as you. So we find that, uh, you know, the wasteland, among other things, it mentions bankers, it mentions typists, it mentions, uh, you know, clerks, insurance agents. So in other words, it mentions a very uh, mixed uh, uh, example of London demography in terms of being a financial center. So Flip is a Phoenician uh, who was mentioned over here is a mythical figure, again, one of the archetypal drowning figures in Western myths, uh, Jedi Christian myths. Uh, but he is used the way he had to talk about to underline the whole think, feeling of sinking, the sinking feeling that comes to London inhabitants. And we find how London keeps getting mentioned in the wasteland as a city in connection to Rome, in connection to the ancient mythical cities which fell historically and mythically. So London too is compared to such a city, such a metropolis, which is uh, obviously mutable but also coming to a natural end, uh, dying a natural death. Right? So, uh, and this particular image of the uh, human corpse at the bottom of the sea while passing through stages of age and youth inside the sea uh, is obviously a, an example of temporality uh, or the decadence of temporality, how temporality becomes a decadent condition, a sterile condition, right where age and youth pass away very quickly and all you can look forward to is decadence and then death. So dead by water is about decadence, dead by water is about existential sinking uh, and flip is the Phoenician is uh, who is a fortnight dead. So again, we have this image of deadness growing or the temporality emerging out of deadness. If you remember the first section, uh, Burial of the Dead, uh, it talks about how there's this, you know, corpse planted in a garden and it's beginning to sprout. Whereas the only vegetation, the only fertility possible, the only fertility available is true deadness, is true markers of deadness, right? And that obviously underlines the 
deadness and wasteland, so to say. So here too we have Flibber's definition who has been a dead, who has been dead for a fortnight. So again, the deadness growing or emerging or continuing, the only life available, the only animation available, the only growth available is through deadness and that's something which is being underlined here as well. Now that brings us to the final section of the wasteland, what of thunder said and we find that in this particular section there are lots of references to Jesus, uh, lots of references to the betrayal of Jesus, uh, the garden where he got betrayed and you know the references of Zudas and also the whole idea of uh, the walking third figure who is an invisible presence but his footprints are seen uh, in the sand. So again that, that uh, you know, that's a very interesting combination of spectrality and spirituality. Right, so spectrality normally has negative connotations in the wasteland and everywhere, but that spectrality is also a sort of a protective spirituality. So that, that combination is interesting, that's a very complex combination um, the elite is trying to underline. And, and what's even more interesting is the fact that uh, by the time this section ends, by the time the wasteland ends as a poem, we find that there are a lot of references to uh, Eastern myths, especially the Brihadika Upanishad. Uh, that Eliot mentions uh, when he talks about Datta, Deadham, Damyata, and then Shanti, 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 with which the poem ends. Uh, so there's a reference to us looking at the East, there's a reference to us looking towards uh, uh, other forms of knowledge, other forms of spirituality. And we've already seen how uh, the section, uh, the uh, fire sermon, is a reference to Buddha's sermon. Uh, the whole spirituality of Buddha, the spiritual message of Buddha of moving beyond physical pleasures, sexual pleasures and getting through nirvana, uh, through spirituality, right? So that sermon uh, is something which was uh, part of the uh, message in Wasteland. Now this section what the thunder said, it begins with references to Christ. So this should be on the screen and the text goes as follows. After the torchlight red and sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We who are living are now dying with a little patience. So again, the whole idea of dying with a little patience, uh, dying as a movement, dying as the only movement available, dying as the only uh, form of life available is something which the wasteland keeps dramatizing. He who was living is now dead. That could be a reference to the death of uh, uh, Christianity as a figure, death of Christ as a you know, spiritual figure, as a faith figure, uh, something which is dead, something which you can't connect to anymore. Uh, and then you cut back into present, uh, present London uh, where it is being said, we who are now living are now dying with a little patience. So this is something like uh, the death of faith uh, or the collapse of faith and with the collapse of faith, uh, the spiritual sustenance going away, uh, everything else just becomes a biological phenomenon. If you take the, the faith away, if you take spirituality away, if you take the whole idea of the human spirit away, uh, everything else just becomes bodies ticking away. Uh, it's like a time tick uh, towards death. So everything now is now movement towards death because there's no spirituality, there's no comfort, there's no sustenance left at all. And in that sense, uh, the wasteland connects very interestingly with Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, which, which actually is uh, it occupies a historical moment where uh, Darwinism comes up in a big way and you know the entire loss of faith in the Christian church and how Darwinism suddenly makes things difficult and to, to believe, to grasp. It's a paradigm shift and the trauma and the shock when such an epistemic paradigm shift takes place, when the level of knowledge changes, when the understanding of knowledge changes, when the knowledge and knowledge changes, so to speak, uh, that poem occupies a moment of shock. So Wasteland is a further uh, consolidation of that shock, consolidation of that deadness of faith uh, in the Western world, which Eliot is uh, dramatizing. And as you know, a little biographical details, but Eliot is interesting. Uh, he was seriously considering becoming a Buddhist when he was writing The Wasteland, which was, uh, by the way, written in, in an asylum in Lausanne. Uh, and then, obviously, after this, he became a Catholic. So some of his later poetry, um, his more spiritual poetry, the Four Quarters, for instance, are deeply Catholic in quality. Um, and so the wasteland re represents that purgation period in his life where everything is just sort of burning away. And obviously the burning, 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 burning image comes in the fire sermon with reference to St. Augustine. Okay, but the whole idea of we who are living now are now dying is an is example of how the loss of spirituality, loss of spiritual sustenance, the loss of faith, so to speak, uh, makes human beings you know, just biological, mere biological organisms ticking away to us death. Okay, and then we continue reading the poem. Here is no water but only rock, rock and no water and a sandy road. 
the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains uh, of rock without water. So again, look at the reputation of rock and water and road and water and rock again. So the whole, the, the whole geography over here is not really about a natural landscape. Uh, it's actually about the mindscape, it's, it's about the spiritual landscape, which has become rocky and mountainous and waterless. And the waterlessness is important because just prior to this, we saw images of people drowning in water. So we know this is not exactly about water per se, not the mineral water. Right, this is about the spiritual sustenance and the, the lack of water, the waterlessness is actually what causes, causes the drowning. So it's not really an ontological opposite. So waterlessness and drowning, they're actually connected and they're connected and point to the same existential condition of despair and drowning, right? So that's something which we need to keep in mind. The waterlessness is what causes drowning in the wasteland. It's not really about the physical availability of water. So here is no water but only rock, rock and no water and a sandy road, the road winding above and among the mountains which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water we should stop and drink, amongst the rock one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand, if there were only water amongst the rock. A dead mountain mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit, here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. There's not even a silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. So the sterile thunder is an important me metaphor over here. The sterility of rain, the rain which doesn't actually bring in a regeneration. And we talked about how even reproduction in the wasteland, we talked about sexual reproduction, we talked about uh, pills taken to enhance one's sexuality, pills taken to make oneself more sexually attractive. And the only reference to the First World War is about sexuality, when the soldiers come back from the war and they want to have good time with a woman. And we have this anxious woman talking to each other in the pub. Very working class conversations about taking pills and making yourself more sexually attractive to the men who are coming back from the war. And you find that it's entirely about loveless sex. It's about reproduction without regeneration. Right? So we talked about producing children, but that's just a continuation of deadness. So this break between reproduction and regeneration is something which the wasteland is traumatizing over and over again. So there are rain, but these are sterile rains. These are thunders which are, would, 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 don't have any sustenance in them. They don't really bring anything new. It's just a continuation of deadness. Okay, and thus lies the significance of sterile thunder without rain. There's not even solitude in the mountains, but red sullen faces sneer and snarl from door of mud cracked houses. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water and water, a spring, a pool among the rock. If there were the sound of water only, not the cesada, the dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip drop, drip drop, drop drop drop, but there is no water. Okay, so. Uh, Elliot takes a lot of pains to talk about the waterlessness over here and as we just mentioned the waterlessness is not about the physical unavailability of water. The waterlessness is a faithlessness which has been talked about in a symbolic significance way. So the waterlessness causes a drowning, you know, the drowning which comes out of the loss of faith. And then there's a direct reference to Christ. Uh, the spectral figure, the spiritual figure who is invisible but at the same time who makes his presence felt. Uh, and the lines go like, uh, who is a third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together, but there's always another walking beside you, gliding wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? So the, the invisible figure or the, the faith figure who is invisible, but walking beside you in a desert, right? So someone is making his footprints felt, uh, but you know, without being physically uh, present. What is that sound high in the air? Murmur of maternal lamentation. Who are these hooded herds swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth, ringed by the flood horizon only? What is a city over the mountains, cracks and reforms and bears in the violet air? Falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London, unreal. So look at the way again London as a city, as a metropolis is connected to the uh, mythically, archetypically fallen cities, right? Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, all the cities which were burned, which came to an end, which died a natural death, Vienna and now London. So London is in continuation of that uh, spectrum of fallen cities. And the final image, the final line, the final word is unreal. Right? So all these cities are becoming unreal in the sense of dying a natural death. So London too is a wasteland, is a purgatorio. And as I mentioned that the entire poem begins with uh, a reference to Dante's and for Divine Comedy. So if you divide Dante's Divine Comedy into three different spectrum, we have uh, the, the entire idea of hell 
uh, and then followed by the purgation phase and then we have the paradise phase, right? So this is the purgatorio, right? So inferno, purgatorio, paradiso, right? So this is the purgatory where everything burns away and only the end of it do we have any hope uh, for a paradiso. So London is connected as a, as a geographical historical space. London suddenly becomes a mythical city uh, over here, which is uh, not to say it is elevated into a myth. Uh, it is actually connected to the mythical cities which fell, the historical cities which fell uh, you know, existentially as well as physically as well as politically, right? Unreal. Okay, so uh, and then we skip uh, and suddenly come to uh, the whole idea of the eastern geography which is interesting, the topography changes and of course we know that a topography is not really uh, physical topography, the topography over here is about a spiritual landscape which is shrinking and the image of, uh, this should be on the screen, Ganga was sunken and this is a very important image, Ganga was sunken and the limp leaves waited for, for, for rain while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. Uh, the jungle crouched, humped in silence then spoke the thunder. And now we have references to the Brihadanika Upanishad, Dadata, Dadam, Damiyatta, and then Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. But just prior to that, the whole idea of the sunken Ganga is important because, again, it refers to an original myth which says that all the waters in the world actually come from Ganga. So, Ganga over here doesn't really, is not really about a river over here. It's about the sinking or the shrinking away of the source of water which uh, sustains us as a planet, which sustains us as human beings, as humanity. Right, so Ganga was sunken. So the sinking of Ganga is an important figure way. And again, it's sort of alluding to a drawing on the mythical map, uh, the mythical meaning map, which is being referred to over here. The waterlessness uh, is what is being talked about over here. Ganga was sunken, and the limp leaves waited for rain. The limp leaves waiting for rain also becomes an inertia. Also becomes this futile, Sisyphean wait for regeneration, which doesn't happen. Well, the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. So Himavant, of course, is the, you know, the, the mountainous region which forms Himalayas. The jungle crouched, humped in silence, then spoke the thunder. So the voice of thunder comes away. Yeah. And obviously, interestingly, what Eliot draws on in terms of offering the only example, the only possibility of regeneration is not any Western myth, but Eastern myths. He, he refers to uh, Indian philosophy, he refers to the Upanishads uh, in terms of the only possibility of regeneration coming from there. And of course, as you know, I mean, if you situate it historically in modernism, uh, there's a lot of interest, intellectual as well as spiritual, uh, in terms of looking at the Eastern philosophy, the Indian philosophers. This is also a time where these texts were getting translated. The translation industry was big and booming at that point of time. And of course, the spiritual faith landscape uh, in the Western world was under some sort of crisis, uh, still coping with Darwinism, the First World War, so all that was like big blows at the entire uh, tenets of noble and you know, peace-loving Christianity. So the whole anxiety to look at something which is from the other world and to grasp it, uh, sometimes unproblematically, uh, is something which modernism does over and over again, right? So the whole reference to uh, you know, non-Western mythical frameworks, non-Western mythical figures, uh, and also this is a time where non-Western literary figures were becoming important. Uh, again, for the same political reason, you know, in terms of looking at alternative uh, orders of literature, alternative voices of literature and spirituality. I mean, Togo was a big phenomenon. I mean, Eliot was a student in London, uh, where Togo was a celebrity after having won the Nobel Prize. But the references to uh, in the Indian and uh, non-Western uh, literary landscapes are quite pervasive in Eliot's poetry, and the Western is no exception. Actually, dramatizes it quite strongly towards the end. Thus, then spoke the thunder. Da, datta, what have we given? So datta, the Adhan and Damiyatta, so datta is giving, generosity, charity, uh, the Adhan is kindness, compassion, and Damiyatta is obviously uh, the whole idea of compassion uh, in a more existential sense. So uh, the whole idea of giving, charity, kindness, and compassion put together that can only take you to a piece uh, which is mentioned at the end, um, Shanti, 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 which I'll to describe later as a piece with passive understanding and some kind of a metaphysical piece which cannot be understood empirically or analyzed empirically. Right? So again, the whole idea of looking at the Eastern philosophy as non-empirical is very problematic, but at the same time that was very contemporary, that was something which was happening a lot in terms of a very unproblematic understanding of Eastern and Indian myths as the meta-answer, the panacea to all the problems in the Western world. 
uh, and, and it is obviously voicing that contemporary uh, trend, so to speak, in a wasteland. Okay, so the voices of thunder speak to each other. Uh, Datta, what have you given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. So again, look at the way in which something as spiritual as giving a body and blood uh, to a moment surrender has a lean solicitor in it. So again, uh, this is a very good example of how London as a metropolis, uh, it doubles up as a mythical place as well as a place of bankers who are suffering post First World War. Uh, suffering a major financial crisis. So, and as some of you know, uh, Elliot did work in a bank for a period of time, right? So, uh, this whole references to bankers over and over again as fallen human beings uh, and situating them in certain mythical existential landscapes is it does have a something of metaphysical conceit quality about it in terms of producing a shock effect, producing a juxtapositional opposites, which will, uh, which will generate a shock and a uh, degree of. Uh, rattle uh, among the among the readers, it'll discomfort you, and that's the whole point, right? Uh, the lean solicitor uh, sitting away uh, in a spiritual landscape is something of a contemporary presence uh, put inside a mythical landscape. Okay, the adverb, which is about kindness. I've heard the key turn on the door once and turn once only. We think of the key each in its prison, thinking of the key each confirms a prison. So again, a very bleak description of modernity as being a prison house of existence where every person is in a prison and every person hears uh, the, the clinking of a key, thinking of a key and by that confirming a prison. So in other words, the prison over here is not really a physical space. The prison over here is something which you generate out of your thought processes, uh, something which you generate out of your lifestyle, something which you generate out of your grasp of meanings around you. You confirm a prison, so every person over here confirms a prison and that can be connected back to uh, the section where you know, we talk about the typist and, they, and a clerk, they're having this loveless sex with each other, where human motor movements become more and more mechanized, right? So the mechanization of the motor movements, or even the level of motor movements, uh, humans are numbed. And I did talk about George Simeon's book, uh, Modernity uh, and Metropolis and, and Mental Life, which talks about the modern condition, uh, the European modern condition, as essentially a neurotic condition, the condition of nerves, right? So, and the references of nerves all over the wasteland, when nerves are back to mind. So the entire crisis of nerves is then becomes a more macro crisis in terms of people uh, creating prisons for themselves. Uh, and the only way you can have any home is through the creation of a prison, right? So the prison is the only home available to you. So again, the opposites over here, there seems to be opposites. But just like deadness is the only way you can perceive life. Uh, prison is the only way you can perceive space uh, in this modern, uh, in this metropolis of modernity. Okay, so uh, and then Damiata, which is about compassion, the boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and O. The sea was calm, your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. And then uh, the final section of Wasteland is interesting where there's a mention of London bridges falling down, falling down, falling down, which is essentially a child's nursery rhyme. But again, look at the way in which how that is situated uh, in this otherwise very somber, profound, mythical landscape which Elliot is creating. And in that sense, at a very stylistic level, uh, the wasteland is actually very post-modernist. Right? Although Elliot would hate it uh, if that were told to him because he was a very conservative modernist. But looking back uh, as students of post-modernism, the way Shakespeare and Rag uh, pop culture, uh, London bankers, mythical figures, uh, nursery rhymes, uh, you know, Upanishads, all put together into one collage of quotations. Uh, that actually stylistically makes Wasteland, from a purely representational politics perspective, uh, a, and actually a very postmodern poem, right? So uh, the whole idea of London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down, uh, the nonsense child rhyme inserted into this otherwise mythical landscape. And then it comes towards the end of Wasteland where the speaker says, these fragments I have showed against my ruins, uh, why then I'll fit you. Hieronymus mad again, which is a reference to the Spanish tragedy, again a reference to Renaissance the theatre. And we cut back into Upanishads where the last, the last couple of sentences are Datta, the Advam, Damiata, Shanti, 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 which is about peace, peace and peace. Uh, the peace that passed all understanding, uh, which is what Elliot described. So that concludes the wasteland. So this is essentially about the decadence of Western civilization. Uh, it is quite, uh, uh, you know, heteroglossic in quality in the sense that it has many voices. 
Uh, and sometimes the voices are one of voicelessness. If you remember the myth of Philomel, which is mentioned over and over again, uh, the archetypal woman brutalized by a powerful man and who is chopped off her tongue. Uh, so she becomes uh, archetypically the voiceless woman. So she too becomes a presence in a wasteland, like Tiresias, who is essentially the focalized figure, the, the camera presence in the wasteland, so to see. Uh, through whose eyes everything is seen, everything is unfolded, visually speaking. But then at the end of the day, he is also an important prophet in the sense that whatever he says will not be believed. And he is, uh, he's got his wrinkled body, uh, shrinking body. So again, the, the example of decadence is there, even in the all-knowing prophet, right? So, and the final image of Wasteland, Hieronymus Madigan, which is an example of fury, and that is immediately contrasted with the Shanti Shanti Shanti, which is about peace, the peace that passes all understanding. So the wasteland is attitudinally very, very ambivalent. Uh, effectively speaking, it's very, very ambivalent. It's got lots of different contrasting effects. It's got lots of different contrasting styles. And all put together, it becomes a very interesting, uh, effective document of a post-war metropolis, uh, which is mourning, which is hysteric in quality, uh, and which is obviously coming to terms with the violence of the First World War, uh, which is interestingly never mentioned except one time uh, directly. The references to other mythical wars, uh, but the First World War is never really mentioned except at that little phase where two working class women are, working, are talking in a pub and talking about their husbands coming back and wanted to have a good time because they have been so traumatized by the war. It's the only time when the war actually gets mentioned in the wasteland. But despite that, this is entirely about the First World War. Uh, it's about the London, uh, the post-war metropolis still coming to terms with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And the entire metropolis is suffering from the disorder and hence the numbness, hence a zombie-like quality, uh, hence the machinic movement of motor uh, limbs. Uh, by the human bodies and the human beings who are essentially you know, reduced to machines uh, in a very, very mutable and, and hysteric metropolis, which is London in the wasteland. So with that, we conclude this, uh, uh, this poem. And I, I just mentioned that I have an article in the wasteland which might be of use to you. So if you just uh, you know, go up to my academic or edu website, and I'm happy to upload it uh, in the online forum that we have for this particular course, uh, it deals exactly with the kind of issues we talked about. So it might be helpful in terms of looking that up, yeah, in terms of looking at how the entire uh, violence in the wasteland is actually the violence on our nerves, the violence of language, uh, the violence in voices, and how that is manifested using a mythical method. So the mythical method can be seen as some kind of a comfort cushion for Eliot. Uh, it helps him not to deal directly with what's happening in London at that point in time. It gives him an oblique reference style, an oblique reference uh, you know, technique through which uh, the trauma can be conveyed. Uh, so myth, myth over here becomes uh, something of an absorber of trauma uh, through which a traumatic mindscape is actually represented without getting too real or too direct with contemporary reality, which is nevertheless present throughout this landscape, but it doesn't have to be mentioned over and over again. So that comfort of distance, temporal distance, uh, geographical distance is something that the mythic method provides Eliot. Uh, but this is a deeply personal poem. This is about Eliot's own negotiations with modernity, with own negotiations with violence and modernity, and of course with spirituality. So the reference to the Upanishads in the end is reflective of his, his own inclination spiritually at that point of time. And of course, as I mentioned, post Wasteland, he moves on to uh, a deeply spiritual kind of poetry, which is very different from his earlier works. If you read, for instance, Four Quarters, which we will not do in this particular case, it will be very hard to believe that the same poet uh, who talked about cinema styles and, and on jerky movements and montage uh, visual narratives and perfoc and other observations. It's very different stylistically. So this particular poem is something of a transition poem for Eliot. And he moves on to his own personal paradise in the end. So if we break down Eliot's own poetic career into its Dantesque structure, uh, his earlier poetry is Inferno, where it talks about burning and jerky movements and alienation and all the rest of it. And then Wasteland comes as some kind of a purgatory of and everything burns away. And then post this, he moves on to his paradiso, which is four quatrains, which is very calm, very compassionate. Uh, it's got more, uh, you know, stability about it uh, at the level of poetic landscape. But anyway, with that we conclude Wasteland and move on to the next text in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.